good to see you again. Uh, only announcements are we'll be meeting online uh, Wednesday night and then hope to see you again in person next Sunday morning. Uh, prayer request, I want to urge you to continue to keep Ted in your prayers as well as his family. Uh, this is a difficult time since unable to visit him as he's in the hospital. But even as he comes home, I ask that you remember him in prayer. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another day. We thank you for Ted and pray, continue to pray for your healing and your strength. We pray for, for Janice uh, and family. We, we pray for your grace and your peace. And Lord, as we gather again, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, that as we read your word, that we might understand and that, Lord, we might apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I mentioned that one of the lessons I believe God wants to teach us as believers, and here's something else that I've seen uh, in this time, and and, and that is how close we seem to be to the events that are described in the book of Revelation. Now, I admit, when I've read the book of Revelation in the past, uh, I just haven't understood how we could get to the point that John describes. You know, I believe what he says will happen. I just don't understand how some of those things could happen. I just haven't understood how we could get from where we are to where the church is then, where the world is then. You know, we're here at point one, and, and what he describes is, is at point two. For example, I haven't understood how the world, much, much less Christians, could come to accept the mark of the beast. How Christians could accept a, a one church, a one world church. However, however, after all that's happened in the, in the past couple of months, I don't think we're at point one anymore. We're closer. We're, we're further along the path. Closer to point ten. And now I'm beginning to see how we could come to that point and accept some of the things that the Bible says people will accept. For example, I'm, I'm hearing about putting chips in your arms that will allow authorities to know if you've received a vaccine for the coronavirus or, or maybe what they do is they just put the chip in the vaccine so that when you receive the vaccine, you you get this chip. Then, whenever you go to a public building or, or you ride on and fly on an airplane, you're going to be scanned. And if you don't have this chip showing that you've been vaccinated, then you won't be able to go into the building. You won't be able to fly. This last week, I heard a highly regarded lawyer say that the government has the authority to to make you get a vaccine. Because he said you have no authority to spread a virus. He put it this way, he says, let me put it very clearly, you have no constitutional right to endanger the public and spread the disease, even if you disagree. You have no right not to be vaccinated. You have no right not to wear a mask. You have no right to open your business. Now, I would disagree, but I'm not a lawyer or a constitutional expert, and he is. You know, and that just sounds crazy to me to hear him talk like that. However, if six months ago I had told you that in the United States this year every church building would be closed by the government, what would you have said? Now, not all churches have closed in this time. There, there have been a few that have remained open and met in person. One church in Holly Springs, Mississippi, 
stay, has stayed open in these last couple of months. However, this last Wednesday, that building was burned to the ground. In Tennessee, we are now allowed to meet in person, but we're not supposed to meet as we did three months ago. We're supposed to only allow a certain number in the building, and we're supposed to remain uh, socially distant apart, spread out throughout the building, wiping everything down between services. And there are some states who still refuse to allow churches to meet, no matter how many. They're not supposed to meet. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, and traditionally, the Boy Scouts <clears throat> go to veterans' cemeteries, and, and they put flags at all the graves. But this year, they won't be allowed to do so. One flag company in Pennsylvania has been ordered to shut down. Each year, this company ships out some 53,000 flags to 233 cemeteries across the country. The flags have already been made. They just need to be boxed up and shipped, but the governor has told them no. If six months ago I had told you that these things would be happening in the United States today, would you have called me crazy? And so we're moving closer. I see us moving closer to those descriptions that John describes in Revelation. And I don't share all of this with you to, to make you mad or to scare you, but to make you think. To think especially about how we view our faith, our walk with God, our salvation, and how we view the church. This last, Wednesday's night, uh, this last Wednesday night, I, I read about an email I had received describing the condition of churches in Vietnam. I read a quote from one preacher who said, Before persecution came, our faith was only theory. Now, we truly practice our faith. Now, it's reality. You know, persecution has a way of bringing our faith into focus. It, it helps us to eliminate all those things that aren't necessary, aren't important, and makes us focus on what is. It also has a way of, of sifting through the chaff, and, chaff and, and showing us who is serious about their faith and who is not. I came across this article a few days ago about churches in North Korea where being a Christian is considered treasonous and citizens are required to spy on each other and to report religious activity of neighbors. Now, because citizens are not, uh, Christians are not allowed to meet in public, you know, they have to meet in their own homes. Todd Nettleton uh, who works with the Voice of the Martyrs, explains, a church meeting inside North Korea is only two or three people, typically from within the same family. Those that have Bibles likely read very late at night with all the windows of their homes blocked, and sometimes, even with the windows blocked, they read under a blanket, in a closet, or somewhere else. They're less likely to to be noticed. I read about one ministry that sends balloons into North Korea and they, they put Bibles in the, these helium-filled balloons in order to carry them across the border so that people might have access to them. They also broadcast radio signals into North Korea with people reading the Bible and they do so very slowly so that those listening might be able to copy down the verses as they're read. Because this is the closest most will ever come to owning their own copy of the Bible. Todd Nettleton says, Obviously, we can't send missionaries to North Korea, but the gospel is getting in creatively. There is a church in North Korea, though it doesn't look anything like our churches. 
when we gather together with believers in the United States. One of the challenges for Christian parents in North Korea is, when do I tell my children about Jesus? Because if my children say something wrong at school, I'm going to go to prison. You know, that's a serious question. And we need to consider, you know, our faith. And how would we, how, what would we do if the church was no longer allowed to meet? You know, if we were no longer allowed to meet in the church building, what would we do? Would you be able to lead a church in your home? Uh, this last Wednesday, I wasn't able to, uh, to upload our Wednesday night service on Facebook because of technical issues with Facebook. I tried numerous times during the day. I, I tried it uh, in my office. I came home and tried to do it, and I never could upload the video to the church's Facebook page. I was finally able to upload it to Mary Ann's page, and so if you were able to read it, or to watch it, you were watching it uh, because of her Facebook page, or, or you were watching it on YouTube. Now, since we haven't been able to meet in person, we've been able to upload videos like this to Facebook and, and YouTube, but what would happen if we weren't allowed to do even that? Then what would happen? Again, would you be able to lead a church service in your home? Do you know the Bible well enough? Do you know your faith well enough to lead it? Yeah, I think it's interesting that last month I came across two different preachers in, in two different countries, both talking about the importance of house churches. Now, neither is talking about doing away with church buildings. Neither is talking about doing away with corporate gatherings. But what they're saying is that there's, we need an emphasis on having groups that meet in homes. Then when things like this happen, you know, we can continue without any interruption. Now, I heard a preacher in March, when all of this was just getting started, talk about the small groups his church has. And he said that their small groups that meet during the week have more in attendance than they do in the three services that meet on Sunday morning. And so when they were no longer allowed to meet on Sunday morning, they continued in these small groups that were allowed, and they just kept on going without much interruption. Now, I want to start a series this evening on what we believe about God, Jesus, the Bible, the church, what it means to be a Christian. And these are some basic topics of our faith, and hopefully, hopefully uh, much will be familiar. However, from time to time, we need to be refreshed and to get back uh, on these ideas and to get back to these basics. And I'm doing so in just this effort. So that if the time ever came, you would be able to lead a church in your home. Now to let you know, in addition to the Bible, I'm going to be using a book by uh, Mike Mazzalongo and a title, Christianity for Beginners and if you would like to read it, uh, you can send me an email, talk to me, I can send you an email uh, with the book and you can read it on your computer. Now let me start by saying that, that Christianity is more than just a religion. Now a religion is a system of beliefs. And Christianity has a system of beliefs. Concerning these beliefs, Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, saying, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. He's saying, guard these truths, these beliefs that you've been taught. And in his second letter to Timothy, he wrote, 
What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. And so we have a system of beliefs, things that, that we believe about Jesus, about our salvation, about God. And then there are things that we don't believe and that are considered uh, heresy by those who teach them. But Christianity is more than just a system of beliefs. Now, a religion also contains rituals, and Christianity does as well. You know, the first place we find believers in the church participating in these activities, these religious activities, you know, that we still keep today is in Acts chapter 2. Verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so these were religious activities that they participated in on a regular basis. And so we have these rituals, but Christianity is more than that. And so while Christianity is a religion, it's more than just a religion, Christianity is a relationship with God. You know, unlike other religions, you know, God calls us to a relationship with Him. You know, those that worship idols, the idols can't talk to them, can't call them to a relationship. There's no relationship they can have with them. But, but God calls us. You know, we're called His children. We're invited to call Him Father. We have a relationship with God, and that relationship begins with faith. In this regard, Christianity is, is like other religions. You know, the beginning point is faith. The faith in God. The author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, the problem is most people believe what their parents believed or their grandparents believed, and, and they give little thought to what they themselves believe. When I was in Israel on tour, someone asked our tour guide how long she'd been a Christian. And she answered, well, my family has been Christians for, for several generations. You know, it didn't sound like it was her faith, but she was simply a Christian because her family were Christians. I mean, she wasn't Jewish, she wasn't Muslim, therefore she must be a Christian. You know, they belonged to that particular religion because it was the religion of parents and grandparents. We need to examine what we believe and why we believe it. When we examine the question of faith a, a little more objectively, however, we find that, that there are many ideas people have about God. Now, some people believe there is no God. There's no God and, and what we have in this life is that's all there is. We live, we die, and we are no more. Some people believe there are many gods that exist in nature and, and beyond nature. Still others believe that there is only one God, and that is what we believe. One God and that He is supreme over all things and all people. You know, most religions in the world are, are based on the idea that there is one God or, or many, uh, many gods, and, and we'll examine those in another lesson, those ideas. Tonight, I want to examine what we believe about God and why. You know, as Christians, we arrive at our uh, ideas about God from, from basically three sources. Human reasoning, the Bible, and Jesus. The first source of our ideas about God is, is human reasoning. You know, people have wondered about the existence of God, what God is like uh, throughout human existence. And because 
Not everyone believes in the Bible, though, you know, that believes the Bible to be authoritative. Some have tried to prove the existence of God from human reason and observation. And, and here are just, just a few of those arguments. The, one is the first cause argument. You know, every effect has a cause. If you were to see a ball rolling down the street, you would know something caused that ball to start rolling. You know, either some kids were playing and, and threw it too hard, or maybe there was wind that blew the ball. But something started it rolling. Something caused it. What caused our world to come into existence? You know, scientists can only say what they believe about the universe. Some set call a, uh, will point to a, a Big Bang or, or a cosmic explosion. They cannot, however, explain who or what caused the explosion. And the first cause argument says that a being greater than, more complex than the universe, we say God, was the cause of creation. Set the world into motion. And so there must, there's, there's an effect, something must have caused it, and we believe it to be God. Second, there's the complexity argument. And this reasoning says that only a complex mind could have, could have conceived and created a complex world. You know, complex, living, animate beings do not come from simple, non-living matter. You know, a bird doesn't evolve from a rock. Well, then the world of people, of animals, must have been conceived and created by something that's more complex. Again, God. And then there's the moral or, or spiritual argument. You know, most everyone has a desire to do what's right, to, to do good. Every culture has a list of, of rights and wrongs. Do this, don't do that. You know, where do these ideas come from? Every culture has a desire to worship something, to seek something greater than itself. Animals don't do that. Where did that come from? And we reason that it comes from God. Now, these are just some, but not all of the arguments you know, about from purely human thoughts and conclusions about the existence of God. Christianity's beliefs in God include human reasoning, but we have two other sources on which to base our ideas about God. The second source of our ideas about God is from the Bible. You know, the Bible not only tells us that there is a God, the Bible tells us what God is like. Because the Bible is God's Word, and in it He tells us about Himself, His personality. And we see what God is like in the things He says, but also in the things that He does. Now, someone will ask, well, how do we know that the Bible is reliable? And, and again, we'll get to that eventually in this series. For now, let's just look at some of the things the Bible says about God. First, the Bible tells us that God created the world and, and human life. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 27 so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Yet the Bible doesn't explain how God created, only that God did create. Scientists seek to put pieces together and discover for themselves and, and come up with answers outside of God, but the Bible tells us that God created this physical universe simply by speaking it into existence. Second, the Bible also tells us that God loves His creation, and especially humans. In John 3.16 we read, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. 
Third, the Bible tells us that one day God will judge the world. You know, by human reasonings, you know, we can come to know that there is a, a supreme being, a, a God who is greater than we are, greater than the world. However, human reason can't tell us what God is like. God's character, His will, His purpose. You know, as Christians, we believe that this information about God is only revealed to us through His Word, the Bible. And so we have human reasoning, but we also have the Bible as a source of information about God's, ex God's existence, His character, and His will. Now, there is one other source of information about God um, that is even clearer than these first two. And this source isn't based on human thought or a book. Uh, this information comes from a person. And, and next week, we'll talk about Jesus as our source of ideas about who God is and what He is like. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your Bible, your word that teaches us about you, teaches us who you are and, and what you are like, that teaches us that you have created us, that you love us, and that you desire to be with us. Lord, we thank you that we can call you Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will see you Wednesday night.